Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's a um, pretty rainy Saturday morning here in Nashville, uh, but it is um, the Saturday before St. Patrick's Day. So um, anyway, we have something to look forward to. I hope everybody's doing well. Mark Deutschman is our guest today. Um, he's got a million titles, which I'll go over in just a few minutes. But uh, Mark, thank you for being my guest today. Hope you're doing Thanks well. Thanks for having me, Jim. Sure thing. Great well, thing you're doing. Uh, I like this. Well, it's, it's been interesting. We've done it for, I guess, almost a year. Hmm. And um, we uh, do it, try to do it every Saturday, try to bring in somebody different just to talk about things going on in Nashville and provide, um, you know, people who are listening or people who watch later kind of a perspective on what's hmm. happening. And, it beats uh, 2 a.m. council meetings, I bet. Yes. Yes, it does beat 2 a.m. council meetings. Our last council meeting was actually shorter. It ended at hmm. 1230 in the morning. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> it was a relatively short, shorter meeting. Um, well, let me ask you um, before we we've got another minute or two. I was asking you before we started that beautiful thing behind your left shoulder. Uh, exactly what is that for viewers who are going to go like, what is that thing? Well, believe it or not, my wife and I traveled to um, Asia and we were there in early January last year when the pandemic showed up out of uh, China. And we yeah. brought this back from Cambodia. It's a lotus flower. A uh, lotus and flower. And um, we just thought it was beautiful art. And I'm sitting in Sherry's office. So she's got a really nice backdrop. More than this lotus flower, she's got a, a thing here signed from Barack Obama. She cool. was a champion of change in the White House. So that's very the, cool. I mean, you can't see it, but I can. <laughs> very, very cool. Well, of the two, I think I, I mean, I like the lotus flower, but I think I want the Barack Obama thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh well i'm glad that sherry's allowing you to use her, her office that's awfully nice of her uh, <laughs> so am i <laughs> yeah okay that's good well let's see it is it is 10 4 so we can start got a lot of people on the call today and a lot of questions which is really good for mark deutschman uh, mark is chair emeritus of village real estate uh, uh, so um Anyway, that's one of his titles. He's the chair of the governance committee of the Urban Land Institute of Nashville. You're a former president of the Greenways for Nashville. You do all kinds of different things. You, do you still juggle? <laughs> I do, just to keep my chops up. I try to throw five balls on a regular basis, but we don't have the same kind of juggling club that we did in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Well, so you're juggling lots of different things anyway. Um, um, I'm getting some COVID numbers. Looks like we have 171 new cases um, from yesterday. Um, so we're kind of hanging in that area. Um, I would say to everybody who's watching, um, as we get as we get closer and there's more vaccines coming, I mean, some of you, many of you may watch the president on um, television on Thursday night. Um, so uh, there's positivity in the air, but I would encourage everyone to please stay very, very safe. We do not need additional spikes. I know of people that are in the hospital suffering from this. Um, it is still out there. And um, just because we see the light does not mean we need to let our guard down. So everybody stay safe. Um, I know we have council member John Rutherford on the call today. And if anybody else gets on, I'll, um, I will let you know. All right, so Mark, First question for all my guests on this thing is, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? How did you get to Nashville? And um, how did, you know, basically, how did you get that lotus flower in the back? <laughs> You've already told us that. But I mean, basically, for people who don't know you, you I, we've, we've known each other for a long time, but um, give us a little bit of background on yourself. So I actually was a marine zoologist in college. And when people ask me how I got to Nashville, I often tell them, that my boat caught on fire. Um, I was and working did, with killer did, whales. Did it catch on fire? <laughs> it did catch on fire. I was working with killer whales in the wild up in British Columbia. And in my second season, my little Zodiac engine caught on fire. And I had a herring journey through the Johnson Straits. I landed on an island and there were two people on the island. And one guy had this long beard and long hair. And the other was a little hippie, his girlfriend. And about five years later, they invited me to come to Nashville where his father had died. Um, and it was Joel Solomon, if you know Joel. Yeah. And I so, never left. So did you spend five years on the island, or did, how'd you get off? No, the I was only there with them for about seven days, but I came up for another season, 
we spent time together, we became fast friends. I mean, it just evolved into a relationship. And when my father died in 1985, I was back in Maryland. His father had died, I came down to Nashville and pretty much just moved into their house in Hillsborough Village. So that's how I got here. So the, all this, everything that you've accomplished, all the stuff that you've done in Nashville is mainly Nashville. thanks to a, um, is thanks to a fire in a boat that ended you on an island with two people that ended up in Nashville. Is that right? Yes. That's sort of the way life works, isn't it? That is so interesting. I was going to say, um, let me ask you one other question about that because mm -hmm. I'm really interested about this island thing. Um, had, did people know you were on the island? Did you just stay there for a week, or had you had you figure out how to get off the island? Was there well, finally, a boat towed me, you know, towed me off. But okay. I mean, the engine was shot, and okay. I, I, you know, got towed back to where my truck was, and I drove back down to California. Um, so that was the end of that season. The whales yeah, we, come in from May to October. And yeah. So they come in, there's about 150 whales up there. It's actually a population that's grown. It's about 300 whales. I still spend a lot of time up there. I love going up to British Columbia. Um, and, and what were you doing? What, were you studying the whales? What were you, what were you doing? Just uh, We were doing what? sort of a photographic identification study. It was early in sort of the study of the orca. We learned that it was maternal society we could tell each of the pod members, there was about 12 pods in a community of 150 whales and they travel together and sometimes mix in super pods. Um, but you try to film both the left side and the right side of their dorsal fin and their saddle patch below the fin to, to be able to identify them. That's what I was doing. Very interesting. Never knew this about you. A whole well, new, oh, we just talked about that the whole time. It's fun, um, it's a fun story. <clears throat> Well, let me let me ask you, I mean, so most of the questions that came in all regard around the development, developing Nashville. Mm -hmm. You've been a player in that for a long time. Um, so the question, I, let me start with the bigger question first. And it's like, um, how do you see, I mean, Nashville has changed quite a bit over the last mm -hmm. 15, 20 years. And um, as we're sitting in a pandemic, as we're looking towards hopefully the end of a pandemic, people are once again starting to ask, it's like, what happened? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what happened in Nashville? And are we just gonna see this tremendous continued growth? Or is there, um, I mean, is there enough effort being made to preserve some of the history of Nashville? So what do you see? I mean, you've seen this develop. Um, where are we going with all this? I think in some ways it's been really good. If you recall back in the, in the 90s, we were a hollow shell of what we are today. Sure. So we, had a, we were the central business district. We really didn't allow housing downtown. We didn't start getting any housing downtown in the central business district really until the early O's. In fact, um, in 2004 and 2005, I used to do bus tours downtown. We were just starting to think about taking some of those 84 vacant, semi-vacant older buildings and turning them into condos and offices. And people would crawl around in the shelves of the build, buildings. And I joked that I was gonna marry the first person who bought the next condo. There was only 10 units owned in the downtown central business district. And fortunately, um, a woman on the bus came in and she bought one of the Westview condominiums downtown. And when we closed, uh, I asked her out on a date and that's Sherry Deutschman, that's my wife now. Well, there you go. So you actually followed up on your promise. That's I good. did. I'm, I, I keep my promises. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you um, know, yeah. it, we, you know, I used to like to say the core is the new edge. We, we really need to focus and build the density in the core. It just makes sense as a city. And we have over, you know, we now have quite a number of people who live and own downtown and it makes for quite the vibrant city. And I do think that's important. And that's where the most density should be in a city. Um, and, you know, then you start thinking about where growth should happen and it makes sense to think about the corridors. You know, we're a, a hub with spikes coming out of the hub and it makes sense right now to think about developing along Gallatin Road and developing along Dickerson, developing along Nolansville and think about the transit stops and where people could build in and around the transit stops or transit oriented development, build up, allow for you know, density bonuses for developers who create affordable housing or affordable living and, you know, make that a natural evolution of our transportation system. 
Let me ask you, uh, okay, so go back to downtown for a minute and then we'll talk about the corridors. Um, you know, some people, I, I mean, I remember when you used to be able to drive around downtown, there was no traffic. Um, now, you know, post pre-COVID, post-COVID, mm -hmm. My guess is we'll go back to lots of traffic, lots of uh, lots of people, particularly with tourists coming back. Um, and then uh, the other day I was talking to some folks who were, we were talking about, I was actually driving um, past Broadway and there's a new building that's coming out of the ground right across from where the Whole Foods is, that building. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, what is that? Where is that coming from? Uh, some people would say it's too much. We went from having very little to now it's almost too much. I mean, how do you address that? Um, and what do you see happening down the main corridor of Broadway, particularly with Amazon coming? Well, Broadway is fascinating. I mean, Amazon, for instance, said when they came to Nashville that they wanted over 50% of their employees to get to work without a car. So there is a place where we have to think about multimodal transportation and stop letting the car dominate the landscape. Um, Really, we, you know, I think about greenways, for instance, and complete streets and thinking about a, a, a population that can, can commute by bike and foot as one way to begin to alleviate the issues that you see happening in the city that's relied fully on cars. Um, we, I'm going to speak to greenways just for a minute with that. We have, um, we have about 100 miles of greenways here in our county now, and so we've done a really good job since the 90s of building out the the county greenway system. But in the plan to play, which is the Metro Parks plan for greenways for the next 10 years, they've identified 54 miles of greenways that they want to build. And they want to build much of that in the core, which really makes sense. So if you're building greenways in the most urban, dense urban neighborhoods downtown and connecting them to you know, places of work and parks and schools, et cetera, you're gonna have a whole bunch of people that stop riding in their car. And if, if you can cr create the complete streets for bikes that are safe, I mean, that's the problem. We don't have, we're doing it and it's happening, but it's still not quite safe because it's not all connected. But as it gets more connected, you'll be surprised at how many people start riding. Um, you think about a city, if you've ever you know, been to um, Copenhagen or someplace in Europe, Amsterdam, it seems like the entire population is on bikes. And they didn't do that accidentally. That was intentional. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, they had the same kind of problems we have in Nashville, but they changed their thinking and decided to make the car less prevalent in the core because it just clogs up the arteries and let bikes, people walking and uh, other forms of transportation take precedence. So we have to think that way if we're gonna move into a, a better future for our city. Well, I know that the, some of the focus of efforts by, by the mayor, by previous mayors, by the council, by previous councils, is to encourage that. But, you know, from a perspective, from your perspective, do you see that happening? I mean, it's obviously you start talking about the political world, the financial world, all these other things that have an impact. Um, with with that much more building going on, particularly in the downtown area, and with Amazon coming, uh, and the space there that's being built. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see us, I mean, um, we may be trying to plan for more, less cars, but do you see us, do you see us getting there? I do. Uh, okay. it's chicken egg type of thing. I mean, we might get so fed up with all the cars, we have to move forward faster with some of the alternatives. Um, the truth is you guys just passed a capital budget that has a fair amount of money for urban greenways, which is really important. And when I'm looking at Faye DeMosmo's plans for transportation right now, she is thinking about innovation corridors, you know, Charlotte, perhaps, Gallatin Road, where you start thinking about density near transit so people don't have to jump in their cars to get downtown to work. Um, and so that's a smart plan. I think there's ways that you can, you can continue. And it's really the cheapest part of the plan. When you, we didn't pass that $5.4 billion transportation plan because it was just too edgy for our citizens. But if you think about a plan like an urban greenway system as compared to that plan might cost a hundred million dollars. And maybe we can get some federal funding from Pete Buttigieg or somebody up in fed federal government at this point to help with that. We nearly got a 17.5 million tiger grant a few years ago to build out 
some of that system, like the 440 section of that greenway. Um, and we can do it again. So we can accelerate that piece of the plan um, and accelerate. We did get, we got some money in the public works for complete streets in this budget too. And that will start closing the gaps and create more of the connectivity. And you think okay, about me, it, you're building an urban greenway system. You're also creating, you know, sort of conservation. You're thinking about resiliency and thinking about the heat impacts that we're going to have as a city over time, because that's one of our climate change issues. Um, you create pocket parks so that people in urban neighborhoods have a place to go to have some refuge. It's better for people's health, you know, and well-being. If people can walk more and get on greenways, their, their stress and hypertension levels will go down. Uh, obesity will go down. There's things that it really helps that are the side benefits of doing this kind of system. Okay, so explain, because you said the word pocket parks, which is mm -hmm. something that came up in a discussion I had this past week. Downtown. But let's mm -hmm. talk about downtown and then we'll spread it out. Again, downtown, um, sometimes uh, besides Riverfront Park, I worry that mm -hmm. all the green space is being taken away um, mm -hmm. and that it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, if people can find a place to build, they're going to build on it. Um, so from your understanding, um, because I'm going to have some of these discussions next week uh, with some other folks, is um, particularly the the main Broadway and anything kind of close to downtown, how do we preserve the, the history? How do we make sure that we just don't get tons of giant buildings down there and there's no place to walk, to breathe, to do the things you're talking about? How are we going to protect that? How do you see us protecting that? You have to be fairly intentional about it because there isn't that, I mean, the green space is getting eaten up. And so you really need to think about Okay, if we're going to bring in a greenway in the Charlotte corridor, you've got a lot of pavement, you've got a lot of asphalt at this point, but as part of the greenway system, do you rip up the asphalt and create, you know, an acre or two acre park, something like that, that serves all the citizens and also serves, you know, for resiliency and, and flooding issues. That kind of stuff helps with our other issues, which are floods, tornadoes, heat, cold. Those are going to be things that we have to deal with in the future here in the city. I do think, I mean, we have a beautiful riverfront park system that's, you know, underutilized in some ways. And it, you know, this, this bombing that we had downtown on December 25th destroyed, you're talking about historic character. Well, that's some of the most historic character in our city. And these are beautiful buildings that you want to preserve as best possible. But we, like other cities, um, you know, when we started building our city, we turned our back on the river. So we have the beautiful Cumberland River, which is our greatest natural resource, and we built facing inward with Second Avenue, like many other cities did, because it was a transportation zone. It was later on a dump. You know, you had pollutants going down the river, and why face that? But now it's beautiful, and if and here we are, like thinking, rethinking our city right now with Second Avenue in downtown, and you've got a good team with the Civic Design Center and Ron Gobble. What if you think about turning your face? towards the river and utilizing the first avenue side of those buildings as you recreate uh, this piece for a street and start thinking about how we can, I mean, I almost think about shutting up, shutting down first avenue unless you're servicing restaurants and things and let these buildings where they're gonna have a hard time economically rebuild, building out over first avenue so that you're connecting to the riverfront park with cafes and activity with beautiful, I mean, you have beautiful, um, open space and park system that we'd want to use all the time if we did that. So, so do we have a, do we have a model to do that? I mean, I, mean, I know when you look at, um, well, when you, when you stand on the other side of the river, when you're at <coughs> Nissan stadium, you look back over across the river at the city, you go, that's amazing riverfront property. Yes. That I would guess. And, um, a lot of those buildings are facing inward. A lot of buildings on First Avenue, particularly as you come up mm -hmm. kind of the ramp up towards the courthouse, they were built, I think, as warehouses. So That's that right. when, when the boats mm -hmm. would come in, they would unload and drop them in First Avenue. And then I guess, I don't know how they would, if they would take them out on second or whatever. So you have all that land on Riverfront that is kind of underutilized. And there was a question that came through about utilization of Riverfront Park. What a beautiful area that seems to be so totally underutilized. Well, what an opportunity right now to take those warehouses and turn them in. I mean, and also economic realities. You know, you let some owners turn and 
create more value facing the river. And um, it creates, I mean, just think of it as an extension of music and tourism and country music hall of fame and, and concerts and all the things that we could do if we did that using the space that's not used very much. I mean, I do remember going down there and having symphonies on the river and you have the fireworks and stuff, but you could have it being used every day. But, and a question just came in, which is exactly what I was thinking. And that is, well, sort of uh, in the sense of how do you, how do you control it? I mean, <clears throat> I've been to San Antonio and the, the river mm -hmm. walk and, and other things. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make it, you don't want to turn it into something that, you know, you come down the, the river and it's like, oh my God, this is more stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you do it? so that it's controlled. I think the question was, how do you make it more locally owned? Mm -hmm. Because I do worry um, that if, if we don't have more controls in place, we're gonna lose a lot of what made Nashville such a great place to, to live in for a long time. It's still a wonderful city, but you know, I think we're, we're losing some of that character very quickly. I agree. How, how, I mean, how, what, how would you do that? How would you make sure that we do it correctly? I mean, I, I'm glad that there's a team that's taking a look at this right now, smart people. Um, and, you know, if, if, if you engage a group like the Nashville Civic Design Center um, that created the plan for Nashville and plan of Nashville back in 2005, they had done a series of neighborhood charrettes, nine different urban neighborhoods and asked everybody what they want for the city. And they took that and they compiled it into the plan of Nashville. Um, they definitely highlighted using the river as the greatest natural resource. But I, I mean, you have to think about the folks in planning and, um, you know, the folks downtown, we don't want to make an extension of lower Broadway, you know, we don't want to just do the same thing and create a right. bunch of honky tonk type stuff. We have enough of that. And I'm thinking that we're starting to create delineated zones right now. Second Avenue has a different feel or could have a different feel with this new recreation than lower Broadway. Of course, now you have the fifth and broad buildings, it's going to have its own unique flavor with the, you know, big big restaurant houses, and then you head up the street to Amazon and their parks and the Gulch, you want them all to have a different kind of flavor, I think. And, I, you know, I don't know the answer of how do you do that, but I do think that it makes sense to engage a lot of smart people. I will say, I mean, the Urban Land Institute, I'm the chair of governance currently, and I'm the former chair. We had, we had um, the spring convention. So we had the spring meeting here in Nashville in 2019. And as chair, I, we, we invited 4,300 people to come take a look at our city. And these are 4,300 people from around the world, 600 people who came from other countries who had a look at who we are and what we're doing. And, you know, we're, we're sort of an envy in a way. So maybe we're having problems internally, but we have something going on here that's unique. We have a fantastic brand. We have a great location where um, we have started really working with our central business district. We've got um, right now we're having so many people from with my real estate hat on. They're coming from New York, Chicago, L.A., Seattle. You know, they're coming from places where there's a lot of density. And they also like the fact that we have open space and greenways and we can get out to hills and parks, you know, in our four quadrants in Davidson County right now without too much of a problem. So we're an envy and it's, it's a tough place to be because people are still coming to our city every day and they want to stay. So you either, you either like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me ask you a question that did come in because I think you're right. I mean, Nashville, one of the things that I saw early on was, okay, so here we go. You know, we're all of a sudden, all this development's coming in, hotels coming up, all these things happening. You're, tell, you're talking about these people that came in for the conference and who are looking at us going, wow, you know, people, you've got something here. And we do. I mean, I think we all realize that. The question is, how do we make sure that we don't mess it up? And so one of the questions that came in were the three mistakes that other cities have made that we should avoid. So we have the benefit. We've always had this to make sure that we can look at what others have, have happened to other cities that have gone through this before. What do we need? What are the three things that we need to be careful of? Um, that's interesting. To, I mean, I think that there is a place where 
we need to look at affordability and, and housing. Uh, it's, it's certainly, people who are coming in from other cities uh, are willing to pay 30% plus more for housing than locals who are moving up because they're coming from places where the prices are higher per square foot. Um, so that's, that is a problem. We really need to be thinking about transportation and uh, greenways. Um, and, and I'm thinking about greenways as transportation at this point. Uh, it's one of the easiest things that we can do to um, create a healthier future for our kids, grandkids, and so on, because you're laying down those trails that you lay down, stay down. You know, you're not going to, they're part of the infrastructure and part of the system. I think, again, you, you're asking about parks and public spaces. I think it's really important right now to, to be thinking about that uh, currently. Um, for instance, Fort Negley has um, been you know, it's surrounded by the old Greer Stadium. You've got a 62 acre park that looks over the city. It's just gorgeous. And it could have been developed in the last cycle. It didn't, and now it's uh, preserved. And uh, there's an RFP out that's been um, talked about. I think the mayor's office is thinking about that. It, it's, they're looking at how to create a world-class park in pretty much the urban core of our city that's there for a community. Um, a residents who've lived here for, you know, decades and generations, and then also available to showcase some of the history of our city with Fort Negley. Um, you have a chance from there to connect via Sixth Avenue right down the Music City Center and in, into the downtown with a complete street. Uh, you have the whole cemetery that's connected there too. That's beautiful, the old city cemetery that you can take in and preserve so that you feel the connection to your past. You know, and people who've been here before us. Um, it, it does make sense. You don't, we, we did have a history of tearing down beautiful old places in our city, but I think we've gotten a lot smarter and we have a pretty robust uh, Metropolitan Historic Commission at this point that makes sure we don't do that again. Um, what do you say um, to, um, I mean, every time I, well, not every time, but when I drive downtown, I'll see something new popping up out of the ground. It's another big high rise thing. Have we got enough of those? I mean, and and maybe this morphs into the affordability issue, which is something that people did ask about. Um, so most of the things that I've seen that are being built downtown are high income, you know, residential units. Um, I mean, at some point, do we have enough of those? And then I guess the follow up question is with those coming in and with now pushing out into um, some of the corridors, we're driving people out of here. We're driving natural long-time residents out because they can't afford to live in the main area or the core area. Some of them can't afford to live in mm -hmm. some of the outlying areas as well. The big issue, affordability. It, it really is. I mean, the, this is where you really focus on the corridors and, and you think about zoning and transportation, they go hand in hand. So if you're thinking about innovation corridors, you really have to think about what happens within that one quarter mile or one half mile around that section. And at the Urban Land Institute, we did a study. It was the mayor's, it was under Mayor Barry. It was the transportation and um, transportation and affordability panel. Mayor Purcell led it um, with Brenda Wynn. And mm -hmm. I was serving as chair and served on that panel. We talked a lot about not just affordable housing, but affordable living and how you really do need to think at those um, transit stops about building in you know, building in affordability, like you have to build affordability. You have to build affordable living if you're going to build in this transit node. But I, I think it's a, a zoning thing and you have to get, you have to be there in advance. You can't just let the developer do whatever they want. You need to create bonuses and incentives for people to create affordability. Um, so you could, I mean, we have the permission right now from the state. I know we had to go get permission to create tax increment financing districts on the corridors and we can, so we could use TIF as a tool to help with these transit development and trail oriented development conversations to make sure that we're building in affordability in as close to the core as we can get. I do wanna say downtown, I mean, there, there is a group that, you know, you have like Rutledge Hill is a historic hill looking over the city and there is, um, you know, they have eight story or seven story height limits through there. and. I know there's a conversation right now with a group that wants to build a 32 and 38 
unit tower that would take some of that Rutledge Hill zoning and change the community plan and allow them to go up, which, you know, I think that you, you also have this beautiful park with, it's a radio tower up there that I think should be a park for, you know, that should be one of our pocket parks to identify. I don't think we should let that happen. I think we should really follow the community plan and put the high rises where high rises can be on church street or whatever, and not let that kind of uh, shift happen and impact a rolling mill hill or, you know, um, uh, Rutledge Hill. Well, so let me ask you about, um, I guess, community plans um, mm -hmm. and following them because, you, I mean, we can have, we can have all kinds of different plans. And then if we don't stick to those plans, then we obviously immediately deviate and then everybody else does the same thing. That question, along with, I know I usually ask two questions at the same time, the corridors. So, um, and they all kind of fall into zoning matters. So if you have a, an area zone and you have a community plan and then you don't follow it because people deviate and then the council decides to not do it or, or deviates from the plan, you've got a problem. On these corridors, if the key is to zone it to make sure that we don't get developers that come in and build, you know, again, multi-million dollar complexes for uh, that really are not affordable housing. How do we, how do we make sure as a city that we know this is what we want to do and we need to stop some of this stuff? You said we need to be more proactive, but I think there's concerns that we're, if we're not careful, if we don't do something soon, we won't be there. We, we won't be able to protect it interesting right now um you have the whole east bank discussion that's emerged and mm -hmm. so that's a bit of wild wild west territory but it it will be defined there is a planning process that lets us right now define what's going to happen you know from river north to psc metals you know and you know what we decide with that plan will sort of dictate what the other side of the river grows up to be and how much of that land gets saved for parks and what happens around our um, sports stadiums or stadium, depending upon if we ever get Major League Baseball out there. Um, um, so, you know, Nashville is growing. It's it, it's not something I think we can put a stop to. We were rated for the second time in a row as the number three city to watch in emerging trends through ULI. So um, the, the rest of the world has their eyes on us. So that's the, the only way we can do it really is to get in front of it. I wouldn't, um, I would might I might use ULI. ULI has the tools to come in and bring experts from all around the world, and we do think about the responsible use of land, particularly urban land. Other cities are dealing with transportation issues, affordability issues, um, you know, the, the the gamut of issues that we're facing right now as a growing city. We can learn from some of them and potentially put it to good use for Nashville. Well, and I, maybe that's a question, not just for you, but it's also a question for me. It's a question for the mayor. It's a question for the planning department and the commission. Um, it's a question for the council. And that is, um, we, um, we, we, have we have opportunities that we need to take in the near future um, to make sure that we have some control over what happens. So that we, if, if we're the envy of all these other cities, are we going to continue to be the envy of all these other cities if we just let it get completely out of hand? Or, you know. Uh, uh, we, we, could, we could lose that luster. <laughs> yes, and that's the concern. And so the question, the question to, to you, to me, to everybody on this call is, how do we, how do we pull everybody together to make sure that, um, that, we're, that we do preserve what we think is important. So I know the efforts on Second Avenue, you know, there's an effort to make sure we, we don't let that get out of hand. Um, but with the corridors and everything else, with the stuff on Rutledge, um, on uh, Rolling Mill Hill, those things, um, how do we, how do we bring the, everybody to the table to say, wait a minute, Let's make sure we let's make sure we have this right before we let things get completely out of hand. So I almost have to turn that back to you as the. I understand. Vice Mayor, you have <laughs> how many council people do you have? Forty. 
40, they're, yeah. They're each representing their individual districts that you know go all the way out to the edge of the county. Um, and it's a tougher job. Like Chattanooga has five council council people um, that are controlling a bigger swath. It's a little tougher for you, you know, trying to govern the interest of so many. Um, I don't know that it should change or anything, but I just realized that that's not the way other cities uh, have, have set up their, their council <laughs> governance. Um, right. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that was done a long time ago and we, it is what it is. Um, it is, but, and I love, I love a lot of the council people. I work with many of them and, and they are doing great jobs in their districts, but it's a tougher thing to govern because people have different interests. Um, well, go have, back. To you have two or three council people who, like Freddie O'Connell and Colby Sledge and others who are really in the downtown. And, you know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is It is a tremendous amount of work. Well, let me ask you this, um, and then we'll kind of turn into um, some other issues that people raised. And I particularly want to do get to some of the corridor issues. But um, as many as many different groups that have come together, and you've been a part of some of these things, mm -hmm. that where we talk about, um, plans for the future, the Nashville next plan, all these different things that we have, all these tools in development, uh, tools of how we perceive. And then you look at some of the stuff that happens and you go, well, was that really part of what was supposed to happen? Is it time, and this is, I'm asking you because of your background, is it time for us, for some of the people involved in this, including not just government, but private interest, businesses and so forth to kind of come back together as we come out of a pandemic and say, we need to, let's take another look and make sure that we have things in place. And if we don't, we need to put them in place to make sure that the next time we look up in 10 years, it's like, what happened to us? Isn't it crazy coming out of a pandemic, you, you stay at home and you're not getting out much, but the construction has still been happening and you jump, jump in your car and you go down a music row, for instance, and all of a sudden, it's like, where am I? I have no idea where I am anymore. The, all the, the landscapes and landmarks have changed and you, you lose your, your place. It is, oh, um, it is. Virgin, Virgin Hotel showed up in about 20 seconds. That's what it uh, felt like. The roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> I get a little lost sometimes. And then you, you, know, you go and scan the landscape. And it's like, whoa, 27 cranes still. I cannot believe it. Everything's just still going on. It's pretty stunning. I'm, I'm, I, again, I was like, when I was the chair of ULI, I met all the other chairs from the other cities and what we have that they don't have is the brand. You know, we have the music city brand that people, that we can, and it's old, you know, it's a brand that, you know, is from country music, you know, from music row, but it's older than that. You know, it's Jubilee singers and goes back a long, long way. And it's a great brand that we would want to preserve. So we do, I mean, this is a little bit different, but we definitely want to think, think about um, protecting our entrepreneurs. Like we have a pretty, pretty vital entrepreneurial center. And um, I think that kind of uh, spirit does lend to the local living economy. You get people who are growing up and hiring local and doing things that have our local flavor. And that's going to create the character I think that we're looking for. I do think that we need to protect our artists you know, we have one of the things Nashville does have is, you know, these cultural creatives that come here for the universities, but also because they come to write music and play in our, play in our little joints where people can sing in the round and uh, showcase what they're doing and, you know, make, make a name in music. And that's hugely important. They're like an entrepreneurial base too, an artistic entrepreneurial base that gives us flavor as the city and that will help preserve our local character. So those two things are, they're not, that's not structural, but that's supporting who we would want to support versus supporting, you know, the endless money that wants to come in here and build the next big hotel. Okay. We need to think, and that's a nice thing about our, our, we have all these different neighborhoods that have evolved like East Nashville and Germantown and they have their local flavor and history. And you do have people who are, you know, people like the Gene Tassels in Hillsborough Village who, really thought about preservation and encroachment and made sure that we did things right. And the people who helped save Hillsborough Village back in the past from Vanderbilt coming in and taking a biominent domain or whatever they use as a university. And, you know, that, that kind of local living economy or local business culture 
that are in the corridors and neighborhoods uh, helps preserve the flavor of who we are too. And I do think that we have a lot of good flavor in our emerging neighborhoods in and around downtown. Okay, so, and I know council member uh, Gloria Hauser just joined. Um, tell me about the corridors, uh, Dickerson Road, Charlotte Pike, those things. <coughs> What do you see happening on those? Obviously there was lots of discussion when we were talking about the big transit plan mm -hmm. um, and light rail and, and how to, and then the development along the corridors. What do you see happening along that? And, and at this point, again, <clears throat> do we have the protections in place to make sure that as those things develop, mm -hmm. that we do preserve the nature of those areas and the nature of those neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, again, zoning and transportation go hand in hand. So if we pick a corridor, let's say Gallatin. So Gallatin runs through East Nashville, got hit by the tornado March 3rd last year, again, um, goes out to Madison, which is a little hotbed in its own way right now. And then you have, if you look at most of our corridors, they're all based on a car-centric um, society that emerged after urban flight. And so you've got a lot of uh, parking, you know, pay parking and stuff you have a lot of little joints but you have a lot of little things that are just destinations for people who would be driving out to the suburbs and stopping one way or the other so now you have to look at it a little bit differently you have to look at the lens of what happens in and around each designated transit stop and what are we going to do to preserve affordability and local if that's what you you know local living economy support the makers in those neighborhoods and then how do you preserve the housing that's around it you don't want the the transit stop to then, you know, push out into um, all the urban neighborhoods and cause people's houses to get torn down and replaced with something else. Um, by the way, there's some things that we can do with that too. I, I, we did a Go Green campaign back in 2009, 2010, where we retrofit houses for energy savings. We did this through ULI. And we found that um, with working with Hands on Nashville and then working with re Rebuilding Nashville together, we found that you could actually build value, you recreate value in these houses so that the house is worth more than the lot. And it turns, um, it keeps, uh, and a lot of these were older older widows, for instance, who would, would otherwise might have sold, they stay in their house, becomes a multi-generational household and so it slows down the gentrification process and slows down the tall skinnies that people complain about. Um, um, but I think we could do a lot more of that. We have a whole, bunch of older 50, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s houses in, in the surrounding neighborhoods that we'd probably prefer to preserve versus have them. If you don't preserve the affordable stock, then you're going to have a, a, a worse problem. So at least try to preserve the stock that you have as you, as you contemplate the problem of affordability and building more to serve future households. All right, so a question came in about dedicated funding sources for transit and transportation. Um, what do you think about that? A dedicated source to, to actually um, kind of push the issues you initially were talking about, about transportation, um, and particularly in a way to, to deal with the, the concerns about the corridors. Would that be a dedicated tax, something that is like a tax, sales tax or something like that? Yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, I think we should build out the urban greenway system as fast as possible. So yeah. more power to it if we can get it done. I think that we should focus on getting that done sooner rather than later. Uh, I don't really know about you know another sales tax and how that works. It, it's- um, You'll have to leave that one up to us, I think. We'll yeah, to me, I mean, I feel like, you know, we have a property tax issue, in fact, you know, if, if this referendum ever gets passed, we will we'll be killed right now. We've, we've managed to, to create a good budget and um, balance it here in the city during a pandemic, which is a good thing. We needed a property tax increase and it should have happened a couple times in the past to stay, stay aligned with, with what we needed as a city. And it's one of our only funding sources and it's a place, and we, we have to be less generous at the um, Board of Equalization with some of the folks come in and ask to get their property taxes reduced because they're, you know, they have tax lawyers or something helping them to do that. We just need to not do that. We need to make sure people are paying their fair share of taxes, particularly in the core where the services are needed most. Right. 
That's our um, main, that's our main income source. And right. You know, hotel and occupancy tax has been killed this year. So, what are you going to do? Well, it's going to be interesting, particularly with um, <clears throat> things starting to open back up, to see what happens with next year's budget. And we've told people on this call to keep an eye on the mayor and the city council uh, over the next. Um, less than four months because we'll get the budget from the mayor next month uh, probably at the end of april mm -hmm. and then we have two months in which to figure out what to do um and um, um a lot of it will depend on how quickly i think um, the finance director thinks that things are going to open back up and with all the new buildings and everything else what is it going to look like what what are we looking Crumbo. at crumbo yeah kevin crumbo yeah so um should be kind of an interesting next four months to kind of figure out where all that stuff happens. So. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you this, because uh, we have about, we have just about 10 minutes left. I'm interested because um, we, we had, you know, you've, you've tied everything pretty well together in terms of what happens to downtown. You've talked about some of the corridor growth, the transit lines, affordability. Um, let me ask you this. I mean, when, so, I've been to cities, as you have, where there really is unique differences, and there are in Nashville of the neighborhoods. You know, everybody has, um, uh, you know, neighborhoods are, are very distinctive, and that's what makes Nashville such a, a, a such a wonderful place. Um, and, you know, now there was that period of time where you started putting signs up in front of the neighborhoods that said, hey, welcome to Inglewood, or welcome to the Madison area, or whatever. Um, how do you tie it all together? So if we're Music City USA, um, is there a way to tie everything together? So even though you, you make sure that everything is different and distinct, it's all tied together. And then the follow-up question would be, you know, when you start driving into some of these really distinctive neighborhoods and seeing the exact same tall and skinnies in those neighborhoods that are popping up, it's like, it's, that's not part of what this neighborhood is about. You know, Vancouver did a pretty interesting thing. And again, this speaks to saving the existing stock, but they, they decided that, and it also addressed a landfill issue, where if you're going to tear something down that's historic, you have to save 85% of the building. So you have to reuse it. It creates jobs and such, but it also reuses stuff that otherwise could the land, landfill. But it makes it a little more expensive to do that tear down rebuild and it helps keep some of the buildings you know in place i mean there's choices that we've made in council districts where you decide not to have historic zoning and then you have wholesale tear down rebuild um, and then like belmont hillsboro has historic zoning and you still have all the character in the front of all those buildings now granted you're seeing the big additions in the back Whereas some other neighborhoods and you know, even 12 South on the other side of 12 South is a different, it's got a different zoning. It's, it now has some historic zoning, but you saw a lot of the older houses just get raised and rebuilt with bigger houses. And so you did start losing the housing stock a lot faster. Um, now you have to watch out for Bordeaux and some other neighborhoods right now and make sure you're not just letting all of that happen. And one of the better, and slowing it down and making people reuse stuff um, does create another barrier for that to happen and also is a sustainable thing to do. <laughs> um, so I don't know how you, I mean, you've got, that's a big philosophical question. How do we tie it all together? And then also create the, you know, the, the little brands of the neighborhoods that make us so unique and distinct. I mean, um, it's a good discussion. Maybe you need a philosopher on next. <laughs> well, okay, so I've got two more big questions. Um, the first is, um, in your mind, uh, just a vision, just off the top of your head. If um, if Nashville really is Music City USA, and you had the ability to do something, particularly in the downtown quarter, maybe on Riverfront or on Broadway or just around there, to make sure that people, besides just having the honky tonks and the the new uh, uh, African American Museum of Music. Um, is there something that we could do art-wise or design-wise so that people do know that they're in Nashville and Music City, USA? I think one of the most unique things about Nashville music 
is the artist in the round um, and all the little places where you actually get the flavor of the person who wrote the song, hear their voice, and then you realize that it was cut by, you know, whoever, Garth Brooks, you know, yeah. later on. And making sure that we keep that flavor. Um, I know that, you know, a lot of the businesses had to shut down during the pandemic, and I know we've given some relief, but we certainly don't want to lose that. And if we could, if we could create the flavor, even in and around the downtown where you have smaller joints and, you know, lots of places for artists in the round and, and um, to, to do their thing in a, in a it's, a, it's sort of the bluebird environment where you're a little quieter, it's quieter than the honky tonks that you have downtown. You're looking for the quiet places where people can express themselves and show their true art. All right, all right, I'll take that as an answer. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the second big question. So um, it's, it's um, people have started really talking about this and this is why it's, it's such a great opportunity to have you on the show and I really do appreciate you being here. Um, I think the question to me would be as we, you know, I thought, I thought the, the, the well, I thought maybe something that uh, as people slow down during the pandemic, it would give people a chance to <clears throat> take, take a step back and think. Mm. And um, I, I know a lot of people have done that and tried to, you know, mm -hmm. rethink what's really important. Um, <clears throat> from a governmental standpoint, I know that everybody's been really, really busy. I mean, it's taken a tremendous amount of effort just to get through this, uh, particularly from the mayor's office. I understand that. Um, but as we, as we kind of, again, get to the other side of this thing, if I were to when, when council members can actually come back and engage together, call, a, call the council back together to a, not a meeting, a, a, not a council meeting, but to a workshop on where's the city going? Who would you have at that meeting? That's the question. Mm -hmm. How would you, what would you put together as an agenda? So everybody gets a fair shake at it, mm -hmm. but so we actually kind of know that we're maybe at a crossroads at this thing and maybe there are some steps that we should be looking at to take to make sure that we preserve, we don't let it get out of you know, too far out of hand. That's a good question. I mean, who are the thought leaders in the city that would help us think this through? And I have to, you know, the Civic Design Center is one group that's been up front and really smart about this kind of stuff in the past and would be again. Um, you, I mean, there's there's a lot of different groups that have emerged that have a voice that you'd want to have in that room. Um, I mean, there's older groups like the Nashville Agenda, where there's a group of leaders that want to try to address the issues of the time. Well, they are thinking about all that at this point and would love to have a seat at the table. But you have groups like NOAA that are really thinking about affordability and displacement and gentrification that you, you'd want to have that group at the table. Um, I'm, I'm pretty impressed right now with the mayor's sustainability advisory group with Eric Capstein and Linda Brennan leading a group, about 50 of us that are really thinking about, you, we have to think about sustainability as one of our issues moving forward as part of any development discussion. You have to think about flooding and tornadoes and extreme heat and cold. And that's just, that's just the way life is right now in the world of climate change. So you have to have, I would have some of those leaders at the table too, to think through how we develop in the future in a way that um, reduces our carbon footprint so we can contribute to the better health of the planet. Um, so, I mean, Greenways for Nashville, there's a great, you know, that's a great advocacy group that really understands the emerging urban greenway system. Um, and just as a shout out, I'll be co-hosting for the third year in a row with my wife, the um, Dinner by the Bridge event in either September 30th or October 7th. It's a wonderful, wonderful event on the East Cumberland Park at this point. Um, but greenways were essential during the pandemic, if, you know, for mental and physical health. If we had had to shut those down, just think where we'd be as a city. Um, so don't know if I answered all of your question, but those are some folks who had to have at the table. I think you answered it. I think we might, I might be calling you back to see because I think it may be something that needs to be done. Again, I'm getting, um, it's interesting as, as hard as everybody was fighting through this pandemic, now people are starting to kind of look on the other side. And um, this question has come up a number of times, particularly in the last week about 
um, <clears throat> mainly because I think people um, maybe started finally getting out and looked up in the sky and mm -hmm. started seeing the crane still and seeing buildings oh. that weren't there, mm -hmm. you know, when, when they, when they started this thing. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't been downtown, you might want to take a drive down and take a look at all some of the things that just kept going or the construction industry just kept going. Uh, it's a, a changing skyline and there's more stuff coming. Um, and I think people have now are realizing that um, it, it doesn't mean that we stop growth. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that what we wanna do is uh, have smart growth and make sure that we don't, um, we don't lose the character of our city um, and I guess make the mistakes that um, the, the question had been the three mistakes other cities make that we learn and we do take the steps to protect it. And I guess the final question, the final question would be, um, <clears throat> um, we've had groups like this before, obviously. I mean, we've, we've, uh, this is not an initial idea. We've had groups that have done this before. The question is, again, how do we, um, if we came together and said, you know what, we need to put this in place and this in place and this in place for the betterment of the city. How do we make sure that we actually do it for a change and that, that we. Yeah. yeah, do call on, do call on um, ULI because we have 750 members in our chapter and it's an incredible active group that wants to be tapped to, you know, tackle the city's thorniest problems anything from affordability to greenways to transportation um, to decking the interstate at Jefferson. I mean, we can find examples of what's happened in other cities and dilemmas that they have faced that we can bring to bear as we think through what we want to do. So you all I want to see this too. All right. Well, Mark, thank you for your time today. It's been really, really interesting. The, the mm -hmm. chat box is full of people just saying thank you to you. Mm -hmm. Really good discussion. And um, I think it's going to be... Um, again, very relevant in the next, uh, within the next year, if not in the next several months about um, that discussion about where we go. So um, the stuff you've talked about, about today has been really, really helpful and I appreciate it. I appreciate um, you doing this. It's, uh, everybody, everybody wants to feel essential and relevant in a pandemic and it's nice to have a real conversation. Well, everybody, um, in order to make this work, everybody is essential and uh, you, you provide a lot of very, very important information today. Um, we have Monique Odom next week uh, oh. from the parks, the director of our Metro Parks. So it's going to follow up along with what you've done. Um, anyway, thanks, everybody. Everybody have a, a very good weekend. I think it's supposed to be maybe sunny for five minutes. I don't know. It's, maybe it's going to rain all weekend. But I think tomorrow's supposed to be a little warmer. Um, anyway, everybody have a, a really good weekend. Everybody stay safe and we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate thanks, it. Jim. Bye. Okay.